Good morning and a very warm welcome to Heartlands here in Midlands 103 with me, the Reverend Nigel Gillen. And folks, today we are going to continue through our Christian alphabet, Pastor Phil having brought us as far as the letter H, which is for humility. Sunday continues sharing the reflections on John 15 with Sunday's reflection on Sunday. And on our journey through the New Testament, we have found ourselves in First Peter and chapter 3. We're at the very closing end now of the New Testament on our 260-day journey. It's all coming to an end, folks, in mid-September, so we've only a little bit of a ways to go. If you'd like to join us on that, why not even jump in at this late stage and read with us one chapter a day. So tomorrow morning will be 1 Peter chapter 4 and make your way one chapter a day towards the end of the New Testament. Joe will be with us speaking about a scratched record. And also I had the wonderful privilege of attending the Bicentenary celebration in Burr in St. Brendan's Church, Wilmer Road where they were celebrating the completion of the church being built in 1824. The reason I tell you that was listening to the Burr Choral Society and Friends was an absolute delight. And the music was composed by and put together by Peter White. And so I went along and I decided to record these pieces. And so I'm going to share with you the pieces that were sung. They are absolutely sublime, even though these are amateur recordings, just recorded through my iPhone. So, much to get through, but first, to kick things off, let us go and listen to the reading of Psalm 111. We're reading from Psalms 111. Praise the Lord. I will extol the Lord with all my heart in the counsel of the upright and in the assembly. Great are the works of the Lord, they are pondered by all who delight in them. Glorious and majestic are his deeds, and his righteousness endures for ever. He has caused his wonders to be remembered, the Lord is gracious and compassionate. He provides food for those who fear him, he remembers his covenant for ever. He has shown his people the power of his works, giving them the lands of other nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are established for ever and ever, enacted in faithfulness and uprightness. He provided redemption for his people. He ordained his covenant for ever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who follow his precepts have good understanding. To him belongs eternal praise. 1 Peter chapter 3 Wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives, when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. Your beauty should not come from outward adornments such as elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold jewelry or fine clothes. Rather, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. For this is the way the holy women of the past who put their hope in God used to adorn themselves. They submitted themselves to their own husbands, like Sarah, who obeyed Abraham and called him her Lord. You are her daughters if you do what is right and do not give way to fear. Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. Finally, all of you, be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. For whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. 
Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. For it is better, if it is God's will, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. After being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, to those who were disobedient long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand, with angels, authorities and powers in submission to him. Thank you very much, Suchi, for reading to us as we continue our 260-day journey through the New Testament. Folks, we've been listening to First Peter in chapter 3, and now... This is the first piece of music that we're going to listen to from the Burr Choral Society. Welcome back to Heartlands here in Midlands 103 with me, the Reverend Nigel Gill. Folks, next up we have Sunday sharing his reflection on Sunday. Hello, brothers and sisters. Now it's time for our Sunday reflection with Sunday. John chapter 15 verses 23 to 25. He who hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would have no sin. But now they have seen and also hated both me and my father. But this happened that the word might be fulfilled which is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. Thoughts on the Gospel of John. Over the centuries, God had worked miracles at various times among the people of Israel. Think of the miracles Moses performed before Pharaoh in Egypt, or the miracle when the Red Sea was divided and all the people of Israel passed through or the miracles that took place through the prophets Elijah and Elisha. None of these miracles were questioned by the Jews at the time of Jesus. Unlike today, when many people question even the possibility of miracles occurring, Jesus, on the other hand, performed miracles in public that no one had ever done before. Since the world began, it has been unheard of that anyone opened the eyes of one who was born blind. The man born blind rightly testified to the Pharisees God himself has come to earth in the person of Jesus. Thus, the prophecy of Isaiah was fulfilled. Behold, your God will come. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Jesus' miracles confirm without a doubt that he was the promised Messiah and the Son of God. Anyone who experienced the miracles of Jesus became guilty if they did not believe in him. How much hatred and hostility was directed at the man from Nazareth? 
a team who had shown only love, there was no reason to hate him. On the contrary, he is worthy to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. The good Lord bless his words in our hearts. Amen. Hello. Hebrews 12 verses 1 to 2 read, Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Deuteronomy 28 verse 2 reads, All these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you, because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Now, a few of us would object to God's manifest blessings in our lives. What would seem even more appealing is the, I the idea that we don't have to do anything to earn these blessings. Or do we? Well, yes and no. Okay, the Lord always keeps his end of the bargain and his blessings are bountiful. We've come to believe that salvation is by grace. There's nothing we can do to earn it and there's nothing we can do to add to it. Jesus' workmanship is complete in itself. Deuteronomy advises that the blessings overtake as a reward for obedience. Hebrews instructs us to persevere in the race. Let me put it this way. In a race, you can be overtaken, but you still have to keep on running. You won't be overtaken at all if you're not in the race to begin with. Some of you, spiritually speaking anyway, have your hands in your pockets and running is difficult and unsafe when that is the case. You're not positioned to receive from the Lord because you're in a non participatory mode. Your attitude is, que sera, sera, what will be, will be. Here's another illustration. Remember the LPs, records, if you like, or vinyl discs. If they weren't minded, they could get dirty or even scratched. The stylus or needle, if you like, could get stuck in one of the microscopic grooves and the music you were listening to would have faulty playback. Have you ever heard the saying, he sounds like a scratched record. This describes a boring, monotonous person who persistently whines about his woes, but no change comes about. He's basically stuck in a rut and his life is going nowhere. Well, that's what happens to a believer who isn't spending time with God and isn't allowing the word of Christ to dwell in him richly. I want to encourage you to draw on the heavenly resources. This won't happen if you're a Sunday only Christian. It's necessary to make time to be with the Lord on a daily basis. Jesus said that it's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom, but you won't enjoy the benefits without abiding in him. Welcome back to Heartlands here in Midlands 103 with me, the Reverend Nigel Gill. Folks, next up we're going to have an uncup on tea. The uncup on tea is going to be about the Olympics, the opening and closing ceremony, which has overshadowed the whole of the games, unfortunately, and people's reaction to it. What really ought our reaction to be to it as Christians. I don't think with all the different things that I've heard is that I've heard what is a godly response to what took place. And so that is the topic or the subject of my own cup on tea today. But before we have that, we are going to listen to a wonderful old hymn because as we listen to the reading of Psalm 111, it goes says, Great are the works of the Lord. They are pondered by all who delight in him. Glorious and majestic are his deeds, and his righteousness endures forever. And as I was reading that, the hymn that really just came on my mind was the wonderful old hymn, How Great Thou Art. Welcome to a cup on day. Folks, the Olympics are over. They're over and apart from the great feats of the athletes involved that won medals, the only thing that everyone has been talking about and getting excited about is the opening ceremony and the closing ceremony and all that is involved with all of that. And I have listened to the arguments both ways, lots of argument both ways, but I have not once heard anyone go and mention one thing. I have heard 
people going and saying that this was a parody, it was a mockery of Leo da Vinci's painting of the Lord's Supper. I've heard the counter argument of that, that it's off a different painting of Greek God. I have heard that we should be all upset about this and as a result every Christian should just boycott the Olympics. I have heard that we should all recognise and realise that our God is the one that's being mocked here and we should be upset about this and we ought to go and be fired up and stand up for God. We ought to protest. We should be fired up about this. And of course the old classic argument that's always brought forward, one of self-pity basically, that well they wouldn't go and do this in regard to Islam. So why do they think it can be done about Christianity? All those sort of arguments being put forward. But you know what, folks? That to me is just, it's all nonsense when you think about it, really. There are so many issues with all of those statements. Number one, why are we getting so excited about a painting? We're not supposed to go and keep any of these things, you know, as icons or trophies or look up to them. Why are we defending a painting? I'm not taking away from the painting. It's a wonderful painting. But no one was getting upset about the fact that the Mona Lisa was floating down the middle of the river. The other great big difference between Islam and Christianity all about this is Islam goes and demands respect. That's what it goes. It demands respect. Christianity, the God of Christianity, earns respect. Yet you heard me. The God of Christianity earns respect. You see, here's the thing. When it comes to mockery and we should stand up for God and defend him as if somehow you and I are going to be able to defend God like, what nonsense? Does God need me to be his defence lawyer? Absolutely not. God has called me to be a witness of his goodness and what he has done for me. Absolutely. And I'm not, I will be. An ambassador for him. Yes. Defence lawyer? No. God does not need me as a defence lawyer. But as I listened to all of this, all it did was bring me back to the foot of the cross. Seriously. And there was Jesus Christ hanging on a cross. And the people were mocking and sneering, making a laugh of him, making little of him. They'd beaten him, flogged him, nailed him, gambled for his clothes. And all the time, what happened? What did God the Father do? Nothing. Nothing. What did God the Son do? Prayed. He prayed, Father, forgive for they know not what they do. And when I look at all of this stuff, whether it is actually a crack at Christianity or not, first up, the world is the world. Jesus said, they hated me. Do not be surprised if they hate you. We should actually consider ourselves blessed if we go along by the words of the Beatitude, which go and say, if anyone goes and persecutes you, slanders you, goes and makes little of you because of me and the gospel, you are blessed. So when all this sort of stuff takes place at the Olympics, every Christian should be sitting back going, oh, I'm so blessed today. This is powerful. Let them go and make a mockery. Go ahead. Blaspheme us Christians, why don't you? You don't realise what you're doing. You're just blessing us out of our boots. Didn't hear anyone put that idea forward. Nobody said that. Psalm 130 goes and says this, and when I get back to my point about that our God earns our respect, here's how. It goes and says, If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? We recognise in the eyes of a holy God, we haven't a chance. We're finished. But with you there is forgiveness. And as a result, because there is forgiveness, this is what happens. So that we can, with reverence, serve you we want to revere God because he has forgiven us he has earned our trust by the love that he has shown the love that he's shown you and me even while we were enemies even while we were the ones who stood and mocked and railed and cursed Jesus so why all the drama You see, I've come to the conclusion the only ones who hold the God of Christianity in high esteem, really in high esteem and have respect for him, are those who truly know what God has done for us, what Jesus Christ has done for us. That while we were yet sinners, God showed his love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. Don't see what the drama is about. Really don't. 
maybe I'm missing something. But the thing is, I think I would prefer to just simply be praying a prayer. Father, forgive them, for they know not what to do. What do you think? Thank you for joining me for this on Cup on Day. Welcome back to Heartlands here in Midlands 103 with me, the Reverend Nigel Gill. And now, folks, we are going to have Pastor Phil with us sharing on his Christian alphabet on the letter H, which is for humility. Welcome again, folks, to Treasuring Jesus. In our A to Z of being a Christian, we're today looking at a quality a Christian should have, but never tell anyone he has it. H is for humility. Humility. A student friend of mine often joked about his plan to write a book called The Nine Humble Men and How I Trained the Other Eight. Someone else told me about a preacher who had prepared a superb sermon on humility but never had a congregation big enough to preach it to. It's not hard to be humorous on a subject like this, is it? But we do need to learn some serious lessons, don't we? So let's read from Paul's letter to the the Philippians in chapter 2. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven, those on earth, and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Those verses are well worth memorizing, aren't they? It may well be that those verses constitute an early Christian hymn pointing us to the supreme example of humility, to one who made himself of no reputation, one who humbled himself to the death of the cross. There's no doubt that Jesus knew exactly who he was, and yet he deliberately stepped down from the throne of heaven to planet earth to the cruel death of the cross to be our saviour. Can we really hold on to pride in the face of that? Now, let's be clear. Being humble does not mean having an inferiority complex. You know, as if we were so far down, we would have to reach up to touch the bottom. No, we need a realistic view of ourselves. We're sinners, yes, but sinners saved by the grace of God, accepted as children of the King, and thankful to be part of his family. So humility should add warmth to our worship. We don't deserve what God has done for us in our lives. I wonder how Mephibosheth felt as he sat at the table of King David. Humility also brings unusual willingness to our service. I have to say that I'm always challenged when I remember the young couple who were planning their wedding and their their honeymoon. And then they realized that a large evangelistic mission was to take place in their area at that time. So rather than miss out, they postponed their honeymoon so that they could be involved. Their dedication always warms my heart. Oh, I didn't tell you what their job was cleaning the toilets. Real humility will mean we're prepared to undertake the most menial of tasks because it's for him. I have to say I love what Thomas Adams said. He that will be knighted must kneel for it. Each is for humility. Let's bow in prayer. Lord, we bring our praise to you as we remember the humility of our Saviour, the one who was rich and yet for our sakes became poor, that we through his poverty might be rich. We pray that we will be helped to humble ourselves, 
to realize that without you we can do nothing, but also to know that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. We bring this our prayer in his wonderful name.